Welcome, everyone. I'm Joe Galvin, Chief Research Officer for Vistage. It's a privilege to host the latest webinar in our Peak Performer series. This series is designed to support your leadership climb by bringing the most trusted experts to the Vistage community. They provide exceptional insight and best practices to help you navigate new challenges and new possibilities. Entering 2024, there are a lot of concerns from our CEO community. The Vistage CEO confidence from Q4 rose slightly, but it was still at a statistically low and historically low 82. The index is weighted down heavily by economic pessimism. Today, we turn to Vistage speaker, member, and our good friend, Mark Emmer. Each year in November and December, Mark publishes his trend series of posts on the Vistage Research Center. In this series, he identifies and explores the mega trends that will shape the year ahead. This series is always among the most read content and highest rated content each year. We're fortunate to have Mark with us here today to share his insights on those trends and their impact for 2024. Mark, welcome. It's so great to have you back. Thank you, Joe. So good to be here. Uh, to each of our members, I'd like to wish you a very happy new year wherever you might be. You know, in strategy, we anticipate the future by studying the past, but we don't look through any type of crystal ball. Uh, we look at facts and evidence so that we're in a position to seize the opportunities ahead. 2024 represents both existential threats and monumental opportunities. So our focus today is not gonna be trying to predict a recession or you know, when is the Fed gonna change interest rates? We'll be talking about trends that are impacting small and medium-sized businesses and their long-term consequences. You know, from 10,000 feet, the way I might describe our economy is it's still in a state of disequilibrium. You know, stimulus, whether it's monetary policy or fiscal policy, it's a lot like a milkshake. You know, it tastes really good going down. And, you know, a couple hours later, you might feel bloated and have a headache, right? So the consequences of PPP and EIDL loans and infrastructure bills and quantitative easing is that our economy is still um, somewhat out of balance and the invisible hand just has not had adequate time um, to correct. Uh, I do think we're in uh, much better shape than we were uh, a year ago. So there are some people that think the Federal Reserve's dual mandate uh, might be outdated or in need of some adjustment. Uh, some people have even referred to Jerome Powell as that friend who seems to come late to parties. But, you know, I think overall, if there's one person who really deserves credit for uplifting the entire U.S. economy, clearly that would be Taylor Swift. Uh, just kidding. You know, I, she's certainly selling some Travis um, Kelsey jerseys, but uh, a great segue into our first topic area, which will be economic trends, which I know are very top of mind uh, for all of our members. So economists have been warning us for some time, our total public debt is around 100% of GDP. Private debt uh, globally is around 150% of global GDP. And these numbers don't include obligations for healthcare, social security, pension, and so on. So the total global debt is about 4X. I want you to imagine going into a bank and asking for a loan for four times your company's revenue. Or imagine that your debt swells to that level of indebtedness. You know, you'd blow your covenants, right? So I would say globally, we have an unhealthy amount of leverage. And what's happening is American creditors are beginning to demand a higher risk premium for the bonds that they buy. And this has created a, a dilemma for Congress. Um, this slide illustrates the construction of our federal deficit. So on the left are the um, kind of the receipts and on the right are the expenses. Now, directing your attention to the lower left-hand corner, estate taxes make up about one and a half percent of revenue, corporate taxes about 9%. So, you know, those topics make great fodder for Sunday morning programming, but the reality is if there's gonna be any serious discussion about deficit reform, that's gonna require a movement on marginal tax rates. 
Now, when we look at the right side of the ledger, you know, defense is about 13% of the budget. I don't see that number going down any soon. Interest is about a third of the deficit and the government is borrowing money to pay interest, which is the equivalent of having a credit card and paying that down by getting another credit card. So I think there's some long-term ramifications to all of this. We are in a long-term debt cycle, and this is dramatically gonna impact the government's ability to discount bonds in the future and go back to that you know, zero rate kind of environment. So we see the bond yields kind of normalizing in this 4% range where they are now. Uh, and we will continue to have these skirmishes about government shutdowns because honestly, the government has no outs, right? So um, the other thing, and, and you know, please don't shoot the messenger, but almost everyone in this call, we should just expect that our taxes are gonna be higher in the future, including those of you who decide to divest um, at some point in the next number of years. One thing that I think is inevitable is that the government will adjust the retirement age. Uh, because, you know, we have kind of the same demographic crisis that Japan and China have. There are merely not enough young people uh, to pay for the entitlements for older people whose health care costs are very high and who are living much longer uh, than they have uh, in the past. And, you know, Joe, this is just a great reminder. You know, we need to take good, great care of our kids because they're going to be deciding which assisted living facility we're going to be in sometime soon. <laughs> Yeah. Um, so in terms of existential threats, the U.S. has kind of been on this collision course and we could lose our edge in economic, military, academic, scientific and technological supremacy. And if you look at the course of history, what's happened in 75 year cycles is the world order continues to shift. So this last happened about 80 years ago during uh, the Great Depression and World War II. So what happens is um, when a uh, country has supremacy over time, it, it has prosperity, but not everyone is participating fully in that prosperity. That, that point of time is inflationary, which is good actually. A, a modest amount of inflation is healthy. But at some point, um, there is social unrest amongst the people who are not participating in the prosperity, and then the government has to make adjustments. So what they do is they print more money and they expand credit. And then what happens uh, most often is that empire then slides down the hill and they have a deflationary cycle. That is what the Great Depression was. So, you know, if you think inflation is painful, deflation is much more painful and this was the conditions um, that were endured by the Romans, the Dutch, the German, and the British. And it's kind of the warning that ITR is sending of what the world might look like a decade from now. So that's the long-term view. Now we can uh, take a kind of a long, a shorter-term view. And uh, there's a few things I think of note. Uh, 2023 was a story of an elongated wage inflation cycle, which we warned about in this session last year and a move to higher bond yields. So I think um, these random spikes in raw material costs and energy prices are likely to continue into the future. And you know, the current threat in the mid Middle East as a flashpoint is that roughly 15% of the world's cargo goes through the, the um, Red, Red China, I'm sorry, the, the Red Sea and Suez Straits. So when you combine that with you know, any particular, particular threats in the South China Sea, you have a recipe for commodity prices being unstable for some time. I would also remind you that oil is the carrier fuel for oil, which means that there can be an exponential impact whenever there's some kind of pipeline disruption or a terrorist attack where gas, gas prices uh, can spike very quickly. We also have domestic threats such as a, a potentially de divisive US presidential election this year, uh, higher healthcare costs, the prospects of more pandemics, uh, the cost of renewables is high, 
So all of these things in the last two slides support uh, a period of higher inflation and slow growth or stagflation. So um, again, I'm not in the recession prediction, prediction business, um, but what I would foresee is over the period of the next five years or so, these are the general economic uh, conditions that I think we'll be facing because you know zero interest is just unsustainable. And the larger that our economy gets, the harder it is for it to grow. So looking at wages, you know, this has been a crunch for employers. In December, we still had 5.4% wage inflation for those employees who stayed in place and 8% for job switchers. The good news is that spread is lower than it's been over the last 18 months or so. And as you've heard me say before, if you wanna pay attention to payroll statistics, I would ignore the government statistics are kind of distorted. distorted. We use ADP pay insights, which I think provides more context for, for private um, employers who want to monitor uh, wage inflation. Healthcare costs um, continue to go up in earnest. They would have gone up 7% this year um, if companies had just accepted the price increase passed on by their insurance companies. But because of the mitigations they put in place, the average healthcare inflation is running more like 5.4% which will tell you that companies are cutting benefits. And what I would just offer is, you know, if you're making just above minimum wage and you're an hourly worker, you know, a 50 or $100 increase in your health care costs is material to those workers. So we really need to be uh, thinking about that uh, as employers. So here are some uh, predictions for uh, 2024. There's an old saying, uh, as goes the consumer, goes the economy. So we expect GDP to be soft. Um, there are some economists who think there could be a recession uh, near the middle of the year. Um, but, you know, honestly, Joe, if GDP is down 0.5% or up 0.5%, that's not going to change, you know, how I'm going to manage uh, my particular uh, business. Uh, but I think there's evidence of uh, the consumer struggling because of, you know, high student loan debt, healthcare costs, food prices, credit card delinquencies, record high uh, housing affordability index in that the um, holiday spending came in only about up 3%, which was considered to be very sluggish. So lots of early evidence that things are slowing down for the consumer. Uh, one of the things that we recommend uh, for our clients is that they should be paying attention to external economic indicators and making them KPIs. So one in particular I would be paying attention to is the jobs report. Uh, the US economy has been adding between 150 uh, and 200,000 jobs every month. And um, when that number goes negative, that's when obviously uh, unemployment uh, might, might shift. But um, Joe, with that, I'll pause here and see if we have any questions. Well, I've, I've got a couple of questions, of course. Um, I wanted to comment. Uh, you talk about 2024, and we know it's, it's you know there's varying reports on what it's going to be, but what happens after 2024? Where does 24 take us? So when you and I are doing this next year, what are you going to be talking about for 25, 26, 27? Because the mega trends you identified earlier paint a pretty you know risky picture down the road, but as we look at the near term, what's 25 look like for us? Well, you know it's the answer to any question in business. It all depends, right? Uh, 25 depends on 24. And, you know, if we really do have a recession in 24, we'd probably have a life out back in 25. But I've also seen a lot of projections where that think that if uh, if GDP growth is one or two percent in 24, it could be lighter in 25. But this is what I would also say. In fairness to a, a lot of the economists who've had difficulty with projections of late, what's happened is these supply chain shocks are very, very hard to predict. And they are a variable that can move the needle, especially as the commodity prices are higher. Um, you know, so the other thing that I think we need to be thoughtful of is, you know, sure, inflation's better. It's only going to be two or three percent next year. But that's on the heels of it being six or eight percent last year. So that's why uh, we expect it to slow down the consumer in 24 and in 25 uh, to some degree. Great, Mark. Thank you. Uh, another comment real quick. You, you note that unemployment you think is going to go up by about 
0.5, from 3.7 today to 4.2. We haven't seen in our confidence index that CEOs are interested in releasing people just yet. Uh, but what do you think is going to drive that? Is that going to come from more big companies? What do you think? Yeah, well, that's that's already the case, right? So there are layoffs in larger companies, which I think are overstated, by the way, because I think job growth continues in earnest, right? But there are sectors of the economy that are much softer for employment, like consulting, for example. Um, employment is shrinking very quickly. Um, and there may be other sectors that have been growing very quickly over the last couple of years, like um, travel and accommodations come to mind. Um, that that sector has been swelling. And if people stop traveling, um, then, you know, we'll have less employment there. So um, I think by the end of the year, it could be that number. Um, but but I think it, it, it could certainly be a few percentage points. Uh, I should say maybe, you know, 100 basis points higher than than it is now. Great. Thanks. Perfect. All right, so let's um, dive a little deeper into some of the ge uh, geopolitical politics. Um, any downward movement by the Fed will uh, be a relief to emerging markets. When our rates go up, their currencies go down. They are devalued, which increases their debt. So there are a lot of smaller countries that are vulnerable to default. And if we had two or three of those, that could push us into a global recession. Europe continues to struggle because they don't have uh, the luxury of central banks that can manipulate the economy like ours can. And also I think of note is the Nordic countries who've been subsidized by our military kind of police in the world are going to have to participate uh, in defense. Uh, the other thing is, even though I do think the Middle East is an existential threat, it's interesting, uh, carriers are leaving that region, but transportation costs really haven't moved uh, that much for now. Also, there's big movement in decentralized finance. So America's enemy was, would love to see more adoption of blockchain and crypto because that's how they can fund their nefarious activities. Uh, and that kind of would put uh, pressure on the US dollar and, and certainly threaten uh, the US a bit as the reserve uh, currency. So the fact that the SEC is going to now allow broader access uh, for investors to those types of things that, you know, the floodgates uh, could open. We don't, we don't dispense any investment device, so uh, please uh, keep your hate mail. But um, I do think there's going to be a lot of movement in that sector. In terms of U.S. rivalry with China, there's a common misconception that it is the U.S. that is trying to decouple from China as if we are the ones file, file, uh, filing for divorce. But the reality is, is that has been the stated policy of China for uh, some time. And, you know, if we look at the impact of tariffs, I think this may surprise some people. Um, our imports from China are about the same as they were in 2018. It's just that the volume has flowed from those products that have an import tariff to those that do not. And I still think there's risks. There are 180 product categories where at least 70% of the volume comes from one country. We you know, work with some members, like I'm thinking about one last year where their most important raw ingredient, more than 50% of it came from Ukraine. So what's happening is companies are tightening their supply chains from being long, which is efficient and less costly, to being short, which is less efficient and more resilient. Um, and there's some important ramifications there. I've been talking in, um, about vertical integration in my Vistage talks for at least 10 years. And sometimes the members look at me like I have three heads because they think it's a public company thing. Um, but we're seeing a lot of movement in this area. The graphic on your screen is one of my clients who's a Vistage member in Las Vegas. They are a residential and commercial build builder. They have a complete, complete fabrication shop. They have two 3D printers. So they are able to self-perform more of their work. This would be a form of vertical integration because companies want to be able to control their raw material costs and their supply chain um, with more resiliency. So, um, and so what I think we're gonna, what a lot of product companies are gonna be thinking about is, do we wanna to continue to do roll-ups and acquire companies like us 
when mid-market multiples are exceeding 12 times EBITDA, or should we be investing in more vertical integration? And I would say um, that may well be the case. So, um, Joe, any uh, kind of questions on that section? Yeah, before we go to technology, Mark, you know, there's so much going on. You didn't even mention the Ukraine-Russia war that, that was just normalized. Um, you know, there's the issues now, as you mentioned, around Suez and, and traffic, uh, China. What do you see as the biggest threat that could be that black swan that we're not anticipating? Well, I think the existential threat may not be a black swan is um, our enemies seem to be ganging up on us and they are they are they are states that they are the same ones that are are doing a lot of the illegal uh hacking and that type of thing and so i think the existential threat um is they lay, line up in opposition which is already playing out in in parts of the world and um you know so we don't want to find ourselves in you know expanded conflicts um that we can't uh we can't defend i would just remind people uh, yes, we have military supremacy, but when we've tried to fight worlds, ha wars halfway around the world in Korea or Vietnam or Afga Afghanistan, you know, that hasn't always gone well. So um, let us hope for peace. I'll, I'll, I'll just uh, put it that way. Yeah. All right. So um, let's move on to te technology trends. So there is a lot of stress on IT departments today. You know, the security requirements are just becoming onerous. 20% of mid-market companies report some kind of data breach in the last 12 months. And many IT departments feel like they need to be upgrading their IT infrastructure at a time that their internal customers are asking for custom applications that improve the client experience. And as Bill Gates famously said, we tend to overestimate the effect of technology in the short run, and we underestimate the effect in the long run. So I think that's the current state of play in AI. All the members are looking for plug and play applications that they can deploy right away that are easy and inexpensive. But honestly, I, I think, you know, if you have your employees using ChatGPT to write your blog posts, and you get a 3% productivity gain, and all your competitors are getting a 3% productivity gain, so what? That is not a path to competitive advantage. So when disruption occurs, what we look for is phase changes that are more enduring. And in my mind, there is going to be a price of admission to participate in the transformative power of AI. And at the end of the webinar, I'm gonna share access to a white paper that will go into this in much more detail and we'll share some of those plug and play resources because I know that's what everyone's looking for. But I really think if you want a path to competitive advantage, it looks more like this. So starting at the base, you know, I would be using your 2024 strategy cycle to reimagine your corporation, um, including whatever your aspiration is for transformation and, and you know, embed digital uh, in that vision. And then maybe it's identifying some dom domains. What I mean by domains is maybe identify a segment within your business that you could really concentrate your effort and implement AI in lieu of trying to boil the ocean. So a, a good example of this might be advanced analytics. Just try to get better at analytics. And there are many AI tools that are very enabling uh, in that way. You're gonna need to build a digital team, a, a digital team and honestly, I would say the traditional IT department in a small and medium sized business is not equipped to deploy AI in any kind of grand way. AI uses a lot of data. You need to have roles like process specialists and data scientists that could cost three or four hundred thousand dollars a year. And you know, I think a lot of members are going to choke on that. So um, I think this is more a three or four year process where we're acquiring um, the talent that we need. And then maybe you're in a position to start to um, automate some workflows, which would be very, very powerful. Examples of a workflow might be completely automating your customer onboarding experience or your employee onboarding um, experience. And by the way, you know, I skipped this on the building the team. You were going to need to be great employers because 
the people we are create, we are going to have to hire are the most heavily sought after workers in our economy. So um, we're going to have to get really good at being an employer if we're going to attract those people. And then finally, we're going to need to build the right techno technology architecture to support AI, which is going to require a ton of integration. And that has been a massive pain point for our members over the last five years. But in the future, what's going to happen is you're going to have an uh, integrated set of systems, and then all of the APIs are going to talk to each other in a very fluid way. And that's, that's what makes um, digital transformation in AI um, so uh, powerful. And Joe, I'm amused that everyone is so concerned about the decisions that machines will make, given some of the decisions that humans make, right? I mean, like somebody invented crops, for example. Yeah. Um, okay, just a little AI humor to keep things light. I also think that the transformative power of AI will unleash whole new business models. Companies will be wrapping technology around services and services around technology. So in strategy, we refer to this as recombining. So recombining is taking tools and technologies and services, services that already exist but bundling them in a way that they don't. So I'm just offering this slide as an example. Imagine an Uber type company saying, we're gonna offer mobility as a service. Maybe you don't need an automobile anymore. You know, so when you need a ride share, you'll have a ride share. You'll have access to rail and bus and scooters and whatever your mode of transportation is, and they'll bundle that as a solution. So what I'm saying is because the disparate APIs will talk to each other, we will be able to tie together products. That might even happen across companies, which is what's happening right now in the streaming business. There's all these kinds of unique combinations. And then when you, what you do is you give the customer the ability to configure um, their products. One thing of note is during the holidays, all the retailers slash the number of SKUs that they were offering. But what they're doing is they're giving customers this illusion of choice by allowing them to configure their products to their needs. So imagine buying a new home, you go into the new model center and you first pick the, ho the house you want, good, better, best, and then you decide what furnishings you want and what flooring and so on. So you know we're seeing a lot more of that in the economy and AI will be enabling these kinds of solutions where the customer will just be able to choose. AI is also enabling adoption in robotics and drones. Uh, drones have all type, types of commercial applications from crop management to real estate and wedding photography. Uh, Walmart announced this week that they will provide home delivery via drone to more than 50% of the Dallas-Fort Worth market, which I think is completely staggering. Uh, and it also kind of shows that they beat Amazon to the punch. So, you know, Game on, you know, that we're gonna we're gonna see a lot of home drone delivery in the next uh, two to three years. So in my mind, this is a very exciting time for a whole range of technologies beyond generative AI, which is just the beginning. The reason why ChatGPT was so popular this last year is it was really just accessible to us. So now what's gonna happen is a lot of other technologies uh, will become much more accessible. Um, and I think, you know, like the first salvo of that is going to be the drones providing superior analytics uh, to the companies that are using them. By the way, uh, my daughter's getting married this year. So I asked ChatGPT how I could save some money on the wedding and the technology offered absolutely no solutions at all. It was very disappointing. Well, you know, Mark, I would give you one suggestion for that. Uh, you might want to ask ChatGPT to write your father of the bride speech. I know that's a huge oh, stress. Go for people trying to create that and tell that story. Uh, but I do want to get into AI because there's no question it was one of the headlines of 2023. Chat GPT hit the streets and it's kind of like when all of a sudden we got Lotus 1, 2, 3 or early generation spreadsheets. All of a sudden we could do some stuff that used to be big company stuff. Yet some people think that AI is going to be the solution to the workforce crisis. As we continue to grow, the demand for humans grow, but our workforce isn't growing with it. And that AI can replace the workforce. We've heard, you know, we've heard comments that say that, you know, AI is going to replace workers. No, AI is going to replace the workers that don't adapt to AI. What are your thoughts on the impact of AI 
and a longer term workforce challenge. Well, you, I think you teed up my next slide really beautifully, Joe. So if it's okay with you, I'm going to, I'm going to answer your question on the next slide and then I'm going to ask you if you have any more. Okay. Um, so AI is going to have a big social impact. You know, I know there's this narrative and fear that AI is going to like replace jobs on a wholesale basis. I feel like that's a little overstated. Uh, there's certainly going to be some low skill jobs that are at risk, but if we look at the course of history, Anytime there has been a major technology disruption, whether this, it was the steam engine or the automobile or the internet itself, what's happened is those technologies have actually created more jobs than they've destroyed. Like a, a real practical example I like to use is we used to, you remember Joe, we used to go to the photo processing shop, right? That industry does not exist anymore, but um, what's happened instead is Apple has created a lot of really high paying jobs and they actually, what's been proven is when there's a technology transformation, the reskilling of the low end workers is better by the technology companies than by the older stodgier companies that they work for. Uh, but what happens when there's technology disruption is that not everybody participates in the value creation. So 1984 per the graph, the average household income is not kept up with GDP, which tells you that a lot of your low skilled workers are just not participating. There is an economic theory about this called Engels pause. And so what I would suggest to you is it's not that AI in the next five or 10 years is going to destroy millions and millions of jobs. It's that those jobs are going to be repurposed and that the wage, the increase in wages for some of those employees might not uh, keep up. And it's really gonna be the people who are deploying the AI who are gonna get the economic benefit. You know, Mark, it, it kind of makes me think there's that that, that picture set that shows uh, Times Square in, in 1900 and with, with one car and all horses. And then in 1915 is one horse and all cars and how the people that used to care for horses probably transition at some level into the auto industry. And that's what you comment on here. The thing that, that concerns me is, is CEOs thinking that, well, AI is going to solve this human problem that I'm going to have. And what I'm hearing you say is that that it's going to enhance the productivity of the people that you have, but it's not going to solve that problem all the way. Yeah, I, I think that that's right. And here's the proof positive that this theory is true. We have had more acceleration of technology in the last 20 years than any time in history. And we're at full employment. So technolo technology in the last 10 or 20 years has not displaced people, right? So um, it, as it relates to AI, I know there's a, a whole different uh, set of fears there, but um, I think what it really comes down to is we're gonna need to up-level our teams so that we are in a position to take advantage of AI. And I really don't think that our, our technical acumen today um, is strong enough to do that. Were there any, any other questions on the technology section, Joe? Uh, uh, no, go ahead. I'm sorry. We kind of we merged the two sections. So no, go ahead where you yeah, are. Yeah. Get it. Okay, great. Um, all right. Well, good transition. Speaking of employment, 20% of urban office space remains vacant as hybrid has become our new normal. And even though workers say they want to be remote, what's happened is that there is a slump in employee engagement and the scores have returned back to where they were kind of before the, the pandemic. And while I think, you know, most of our membership are, you know, very good employers, we do a lot of employee engagement studies in our firm. So I can tell you from personal observation that, you know, we need to get better. And, you know, there's three things that employees want today. They want skills acquisition, skills acquisition, compensation, and flexibility. And, you know, we did touch upon this last year, Joe, but I think the underlying problem is the way that employers define flexibility and the way that their employees define flexibility are two very, very different things. This was a uh, analysis done by the Harvard Business Review and the vertical access 
compares how commonly these various employee benefits are available to employees. The horizontal axis represents how valuable they are to employees. So the upper left quadrant are kind of like the things that are, are me too and differentiated and the lower right quadrant are the things that you would want to do for competitive advantage. So if you want to separate yourself from the pack as it relates to flexibility, offer more uh, PTO. But what I would also say is that, you know, I, this is the advice I've been giving my clients. I think with comp and flexibility, you kind of have to come up with programming that is for everybody. But on the pro career progression one, which is really difficult for a lot of our members, right? If you have, you know, 100 employees and, you know, you only have so many boxes you can elevate people to, we should be talking more about skills acquisition because all employees want to acquire skills. If you have an $18 an hour worker, they want to know what their path is to 20. So we should be having those conversations all the time. But I think the most important thing is to identify who your high potentials are. And in most companies, that might only be five or seven people. And then make sure you are at least creating the right skills acquisition programming for those five or seven people. So in lieu of trying to execute a corporate university, which most companies find almost impossible, you know, at least try to find um, the right training for the people who are most valuable in your organization, and then you can expand it uh, from there. The other thing that we mentioned last year is nothing makes employees more crazy than you forcing them to come into the office in a random way and then put them on a Zoom call with people who are remote. So when you bring people in the office, and I know hybrid's not for everybody, and we have lots of employers on this line, five days a week in the office, but if you are remote, the days that you have people in the office, make sure they have a clear purpose uh, when they're there. And also like last year, uh, we need to make sure we're utilizing our collaboration software. I said last year Teams was broken, it's still broken. Companies are not using their collaboration suites as intended. And I encourage all companies to go back and revisit, make sure you have a clear script. These are the times we use email. This is the time we use Teams. This is the time we use chat uh, and make sure all your employees are using all the software uh, kind of as it's intended. Any questions? Mark, I wanted, questions? Uh, yeah, I wanted, yeah. To, I wanted to ask you about the return to work challenge because you mentioned there's you know, commercial real estate, it's 20% is, is open or whatever. We, we negotiated and now have a set a status quo for what flexibility means for those who can work from home, the hybrid worker, remote's remote, essential's essential. But now we see CEOs are starting to mandate that those flexible workers now come to the office. Maybe it was two or three days and now they want to go to five. How do you see that tug of war playing out when, when, when leaders want people in the office office, but the people are used to having the flexibility from being at home and they still have all these options. Joe, I think the underlying problem is we may not be listening. What the employees want is the flexibility to live their best life. And I have empirical evidence to prove this because again, we've done a lot of employee engagement studies and we've done the before and after. And my 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 vantage point is that if you demand people to come in the office five days a week in an arbitrary way for arbitrary reasons, that is a major mistake. Your employee engagement will go down. You will suffer as as it relates to retention. So we continue to have this argument back and forth on you know if employers are productive. I guarantee you that that employees that separate from you will not be as productive for you as they were before. So um, I would just suggest we have balance, right? So the norm more in most hybrid companies who aren't say pure play production and everyone needs to be on site all the time, you know, most companies are going to those three or four days. So I'm saying orchestrate those three or four days in a way that are highly productive, but give people the, the flexibility that they can live their life. Well, you know, Mark, it seems as the economy slows, more CEOs want to ramp up to that return. And I wonder when the economy reaccelerates through this year, as you said, maybe into 25 and 26, when that pendulum will, will swing back and whether they'll pay a price for that as people will once again have more options and more flexibility to find a job that's going to allow them to live their, their best life, as you said. Yeah. And especially, you know, if you're trying to recruit digital natives, you know, they have an expectation they can work anywhere. 
So I, I do want to uh, finish on that point because I think it's really important. What we should be doing is putting in place a productivity anywhere mindset. So that is, regardless of what answer you choose to the question of how many days people will be in the office, it's incumbent upon us as the employer to make sure that they're productive, making sure they have the right technology tools, making sure our leadership knows how to lead remotely, um, making sure that you know our corporate calendar makes sense and that we have the tools to make sure that people feel informed about things that go in the office. It is incumbent upon us as the employers to do that. All right, very good. So um, let's touch on ecology trends. And on the heels of the recent COPA conference, there's been a declaration by nations and many countries that they wanna be carbon neutral by 2050. And that's prompting calls for more enriched ECG programs and adoption of EVs and renewables. Uh, lithium, copper, and nickel will be the currencies of the future. And EV sales are kind of slumping right now. And it's not so much because of the rare earth elements. It's more that the U.S. automakers were really laid out of the gate. You know, Tesla is having to discount. And um, little known fact, Chinese auto producer BYD has now supplanted Tesla as the number one seller of EVs worldwide. But I think the more fundamental problem is, as I mentioned last year, every nation in the world is falling further behind their promises that were made in the Paris, support, in the Paris supports. And um, you know the cost to convert to renewables is very, very high. So you know you can call and cap call me cap the obvious if you want, but I think the reality is a real existential threat is we need population growth to support economic growth. And right now the planet can not absorb the waste of the existing uh, population. So even by 2050, there's so much demand in industrial production for fossil fuels, renewables will not supplant fossil fuels before that time. So. That is a real societal problem uh, we're going to have to deal with. And the consequence of all this is large scale weather events. In 2023, we had $25 billion health, uh, weather events that they cost in total about $80 billion, which was actually quite a bit less than 2022, but that's only because Hurricane Ian was so devastating. And, you know, the, uh, the other devastation for the members right now is insurance costs. Commercial insurance went up around 6% last year. And I'm, you know, hearing from my insurance clients that, you know, those markets don't seem to be getting any better. And that 6% inflation number is probably understated because a lot of companies can't buy certain types of insurance um, at all. There, there is some good news, Joe. Um, there is a lot of uh, government money from the infrastructure and climate initiatives. And there is a website that, you know, certainly construction and, and certain um, sectors in the economy would want to be paying attention to. This is called the Maps of Progress. And so if you go to the website, there is a map with all of the projects that are being subsidized and the value of the subsidy. So I think this is really useful for companies trying to plan. Um, where they want to pivot in the future geographically or, or, or in terms of what verticals and so on. So take a look at maps of progress. So Joe, before I wrap with some action items, uh, any other questions? You know, Mark, we had a series of questions come in, but what I'd like to do is have you go ahead and go through your, your strategies and then we'll close with those questions if that's okay. Awesome. So here's some things I would be thinking about this year. In lieu of roll-ups, um, roll-up acquisitions, look for ways to vertically integrate for competitive ad advantage so you can control your supply chain. Look for ways to wrap products and services around technology or technology around products and services in some kind of like recombining strategy. Use the 2024 strategy cycle to create a digital vision Reimagine your company and think about how you can take advantage of the transformative power of AI. 
maybe download our AI step-to-step -step guide, which um, I'll, I'll flash in just a moment if folks want access to that. And you know, given the higher carrying costs, maybe reduce the offering, but give your customers the option to configure products in your solution. External, um, monitor external demand KPIs. I mentioned the job report. There are certainly others. ITR publishes a lot of those uh, types of things in their subscription. You know, focus on resiliency and resist the temptation to lengthen your uh, supply chain because I really don't think that situation is going to get any better. Emphasize productivity everywhere as an employee retention strategy and be hyper focused focused on providing skills acquisition and especially to your high potential employees. And then be thoughtful attack about tax consequences. I don't see any scenario other than that they're higher in the future. And in fact, there are some uh, tax cuts that uh, uh, we've had in place that are gonna sense sunset in 2025. So in other words, even if Congress takes no action, our taxes will be going up. And I think if I were a business owner planning an exit, you know, I would be looking for that sweet spot where the cost of capital is a little lower, um, but, you know, be getting out before uh, 10 years from now and um, enjoy the ride. And let me explain what I mean by uh, enjoy the ride. I invite you to go to our website to download the AI step-by-step -step, uh, white paper. Um, I think you'll uh, find it interesting, but the speed of change will never be slower than it is today. I've shared some scary numbers about the deficit and, and other things, but I do want you all to imagine a brighter future. What if AI really improves our quality in life in ways that we can't even imagine? What, uh, what if AI cures cancer? What if it brings us personalized pharmaceuticals based on our genetics and personal profile? Uh, what if it brings us abundance in uh, renewable energy and nutritious food that ends world hunger? Um, what if it makes, you know, makes available um, lactose-free milkshakes, for example? Um, <laughs> but what if AI makes our world and our companies so efficient that it is the greatest wealth building opportunity in the history of man? So I'd just like to suggest there might be a more positive flip side and uh, just know, you know, we all gravitate towards fear. So uh, we shouldn't be afraid. So with all of that, um, I, uh, I hope uh, all of you have a very prosperous and healthy 2024. Well, Mark, I can't begin to thank you enough for not just this presentation, but all the work that goes in behind it. And I highly recommend to folks to go to the Vistage Research Center read Mark's post because he goes into each of all these topics in a little bit more depth. Uh, and again, Mark, we can't thank you enough, not just for today, but for all you do for our community. So we really appreciate that. And I'm not going to let you go without getting some more questions in because we yeah. had a whole bunch that came in and we've, we've been filtering the background, but I want to touch on a few before we let you go. One was in, about engagement and you brought this up a couple of times about employee engagement. What does employee engagement mean to the employer versus the employee? And a better spin on this is engagement was getting interesting as we were approaching the pandemic and then we got worried about other things. Now in this digital environment with both hybrid and remote workers, does the definition and the measurements and the signs of engagement, are they different? Well, you know, uh, in our firm, we use Net Promoter Score as a best practice uh, because Net Promoter Score means something very specific. You are measuring the loyalty of the employee the likelihood that they will stay. And so I think what it, what it should mean to employers is we want our employees to be ambassadors for our brand where they're telling their friends and they're recruiting colleagues in their profession. And so um, what I think, unfortunately, what it has meant to employees is they don't think the employers have been very genuine in providing the flexibility options. In other words, they're, they're doing it Kind of begrudging. So you know, I really think that uh, this is a great opportunity right now because, you know, many of our uh, very many of our competition, they're not very good employers. And so um, I just would encourage the members to continue to invest 
uh, back into their employees. And that's not just cash comp, it's the environment that we're, we're uh, providing them. Um, so, you know, it's, 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 it's kind of a, kind of a formula. Well, you know, Mark, I just to build on your point quickly, as we move through the, the 2024 slowness and begin to see growth cycles ahead, the demand for humans is going to go again. And if you've got disengaged employees, you'll be at risk. By the same token, if your employees are engaged, it'll give you a better foundation because you'll need humans to grow in the next growth cycle. Yeah. And you know what? I think one thing that's really changed in the last two or three years, I think most of the members get this. They're now using their brand as an employer as a business development tool, right? They're going out to the market and saying, you're going to want to work with us. We can fund your projects. We have the talent. We have the depth. And we're a great employer, which also means we're going to be a great company to work with. So companies have been, I would say, much more transparent with their process and their values and how it is that they're you know, retaining their key people. Well, there's no question the hiring landscape is going to continue to evolve and, and re-intensify as we get into growth. We're going to jump around a little bit, Mark, because the questions are coming from, from all over. Any insight into European markets versus U.S.? Uh, you know, we've seen data that says the United States has done the best as it relates to inflation as compared to to Europe and those folks, but what are your thoughts about, about U.S. and USA markets? Yeah, I mean, um, I'm not an expert in Europe, but what I would say is it's kind of a mess, right? You know, the whole Brexit situation has created a lot of um, imbalances and kind of sticky situations as it, res as it results to their currencies and their trading policy and, and uh, those types of things. So I think this the same kind of rhetoric we've had in the US, uh, they've had in Europe. So there are a lot of countries, like I mentioned, who are, you know, potentially at great risk. You know, Italy is one. Um, and, you know, Greece has come back. They're doing a little better than they were. But some of those countries that, as I mentioned, they don't have a central bank and they don't really have the the kind of the, 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 the law numbers that we have that we can smooth out the cycles. Uh, so, you know, I'm not a, I'm not real bullish from an economic standpoint on Europe. I do want to travel there a lot though. So well, uh, don't yeah. we all? I mean, I think until the Russia Ukraine thing gets stabilized, more stable than it is today, uh, there's always going to be a risk of Europe going one way or another. And that's going to, that's going to be a challenge. Uh, yeah. And I would say their energy security is much worse than us. And that's what became evident during the war. You know, as we mentioned in the broadcast last year, you know, the U S is now the largest producer of oil, oil in the world. You know, we've become pretty self-reliant, um, on, um, on energy, uh, but that's not true for a lot of countries in Europe. I'm going to switch topics again. Um, you had mentioned that 27 to 32 is your vision. If you're going to, to transition, if you're going to exit, sell, acquire, you need to start thinking about that now, right? How are, how are the drivers of business valuation and attractiveness evolving? More importantly, how many businesses that you work with in your client base actually have established their valuation? And I say that because decisions about acquisition when, when interest rates improves. Uh, spoke to a member last week who all of a sudden got a phone call. Somebody wanted to acquire them. And they had no idea how to proceed. Talk to us a little bit about valuations and why that's so important. Um, as you mentioned, this 27 to 32 window. Well, I, I think there's a lot to unpack there. First, I would say, I think the private equity firms are, there's a lot more, oversight over them now, oversight's the wrong term. People have greater awareness that, you know, if they get involved in a private equity transaction, there could be some negative consequences to that. And so I'm not, I'm not trying to put down private equity firms because there are many excellent ones that can prop up your value, but there's just, there are consequences for, you know, taking that investment. So a lot of the companies in the past that just wanted to say, do a recap and take some chips off the table, I'd say in some ways that's harder, especially as the cost of capital uh, is so high. And like I also said, I think a lot of people are really shaking their head at the valuations and saying, you know, I, I can't I can't pay 10, 12, 15 times to do a deal. It, it just doesn't make um, a lot of uh, economic sense. So, you know, the deal flow has been kind of vacillating uh, back and forth. Um, but, you know, the companies we work with, they tend to be pre-exit. They're, they're not looking to divest um, right away. But all the fundamentals that make for a high valuation, you know, they, they haven't changed at all. You know, it's 
run a great company, find a competitive advantage. You know, one thing that I talk about in my Vistage talk a lot is I think a mistake a lot of companies make is they they go after the largest addressable market. That's not always the best place to be because you don't have any pricing power and uh, you're just re less relevant in the market. But I think strategic buyers, they're looking for companies that have market leadership in a market. So um, all those same fundamentals uh, in terms of maintaining growth and being in markets where you can have some form of market leadership that, you know, they haven't changed at all. Well, great, Mark. Listen, I could sit here and ask you questions all afternoon uh, and our list goes on and on, but unfortunately we're short on time. So I want to say thank you so much for sharing your insights today, for sharing them on the Research Center, the work you do with our members as a speaker, the fact that you are a member and all the contributions you make. Just a, a huge thank you for your time, your effort. Our community really appreciates you and all you do. And right back at you, Joe, I, I appreciate your leadership. And I think it's so important that Vistage has this venue where we provide research-based data so that our members can make the very best decisions. So thank you so much and, and hope you have a great year. Thank you for that, Mark. I like to say that research without data is just another opinion. That's and right. with that, <laughs> with that uh, to, our, to our attendees, we'll be sending a link to today's recording and slides within 24 hours. Also, be sure to join us for our upcoming webinars. Next week, Brian Bolio from ITR Economics is coming back to share with us their 2024 uh, uh, predictions and their presentation. So I invite you to log into that. That's going to be another dynamic session. And then on February 2nd, I'll be sharing the key findings from our Q4 Confidence Index research, uh, which looks at the decisions, the investments, the opportunities, and the challenges that our CEOs have identified as they lead into the year. Combined with the ITR presentation and Mark's amazing work today, it'll create a nice set of content for you to think and share uh, with your members. And also mark your calendar for March 1, when we host our next member exclusive with the best-selling author, Marcus Buckingham. If you haven't read his stuff, you need to invest some time in that. It's, it's so spot on. Marcus is going to talk about his insights into putting love back into work, making you and your employees more engaged. Connects right back to what Mark Emmer was just talking about, the importance of engagement. You can register for the Marcus Buckingham session right now at vistage.com slash webinar. That's Vistage.com slash webinar, and that's where you'll see the links to this. On behalf of Vistage, Vistage Research, I'm Joe Galvin, your Chief Research Officer. I thank you for your attention today. I look forward to sharing more insights with you in the future. Be safe, be healthy, and, and please stay warm this winter. Thanks a lot. Bye.